Let's take our Bibles this morning, and we're going to do something different. We're not going to go to Psalms. This morning, we're going to go to Romans, Romans chapter 1. As you're turning to Romans chapter 1, you see the, what I've titled the message for this morning, what every Christian should be. This is what every Christian is not, but we should be. As we look at just some verses here in Romans chapter 1. Now, as you're turning there, I want you to think back over your life on the people that you have known, okay? Uh, that's a lot of people, so let's narrow it down. People that have had a great impact on your life. Maybe a parent, uh, maybe a grandparent, someone from church, uh, a coworker, uh, a neighbor that had a great spiritual impact on your life. Um, I'm thinking of a dairy farmer, a retired butcher, and a CPA. That sounds like the beginnings of a joke, doesn't it? So there was this dairy farmer, a butcher, and a CPA. <laughs> and I'm thinking of a mother-in-law. Something maybe they've said to you over the years, something about their example, the way they lived their life, how they handled difficulty, just watching them, how they encouraged you. You appreciate those who have had, who have lived Jesus in front of you. Not perfect but you could tell they're close to Jesus. And they've demonstrated to you the truth that regardless of what we do, our motives should always be pure. The Apostle Paul was just that kind of man. Uh, surely, uh, the Apostle Paul, by this time, as he's writing Romans, a man with his great influence and power, all the churches that he had started, faced temptation to do things from an improper motive. He had to have. Who wouldn't? However, we find never, we never find any record of Paul misusing his authority or his influence for personal gain. Never. Never do we see him using it for any impure motives either. Paul was, Paul was the living example to us all of what a genuine Christian should be. We're going to look at some character traits from him this morning. In these first seven verses of chapter 1, uh, Paul introduces himself to the believers in Rome. Uh, he tells them about himself. He's never met them before. Okay, maybe they've heard about him, but he's never been there. And he's telling, him, telling them about himself, uh, the messenger, and about his message, the gospel. And now Paul turns the spotlight on himself here in verse number 8 in a very real way. He, he shares uh, with these Romans whom he never met the motives behind the letter that he is writing to them. In these eight verses, Paul reveals traits of genuine Christian character. And as we look at these, I'm going to ask that you please allow the word of God to speak to your heart this morning. <laughs> it will do you no good or me. If while you're hearing and while I'm speaking, our minds are, oh, yeah, I hope this person's listening. Ooh. Oh, man, they're not here. I'll send them a link to the message. <laughs> it's not going to do us any good to do that. Folks, God brought you here not so you could apply truth to someone else. God got you up this morning Dragged you out of your bed, maybe, if you had to be dragged. You're here 
because God has something for you. Let's pray. Father, God, help us to find what it is you have for us today from your truth. One nugget, maybe two, one little piece of truth. God, help us to go away having that truth planted in our hearts, determined, committed to do that truth. To the praise and honor of you, in Jesus' name, amen. So as we look at these, place yourself alongside the great apostle Paul, and let's just see how we measure up. Here's the first one. Every Christian should be thankful. I know we just came through Thanksgiving, right? Thankful for, for many things, no doubt. Romans chapter 1, verse 8, let's read that. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all, that your faith is spoken of throughout the world. Now, he starts by telling them he's thankful for them. He's just thankful for them. Now, let's keep in mind, Paul didn't start this church. It wasn't one of his churches that he started. Someone else started it. There was, there was no envy over the fact that this church, by the way, was the talk of the entire world. It tells us that in verse 1. They're spoken of throughout the whole world, verse 1 or verse 8 said. Instead of being jealous, he was thankful that they were being blessed. Because see, we'll, we'll come back to this probably more than once this morning. It wasn't about him. His focus was not on himself. We could learn a lesson from this, perhaps. God would have us to be thankful people. Listen to this verse, 1 Thessalonians 5.18, in everything we give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Thanks for everything. <laughs> You've heard me say it before, the good, the bad, and the ugly. <laughs> thanks for everything. That is God's will for our life. There are, there are some that are not thankful, though. Maybe even us at times. Here's something to consider. As that verse said, this is the will of God that we be thankful in everything. If there's ever a time when I am not being thankful, when I maybe am, what's the opposite of thankfulness? Complaining? That means right at that moment, I your pastor, my wife's husband, is out of the will of God. That's not a place we want to be. The verse, we can't, God couldn't have made it any more plain. This is the will of God for your life, to give thanks in everything. Think about this, though. These words, I don't like this. I don't like that. This doesn't measure up to my standard. This should have been done differently. At the center of our unthankfulness in all of those phrases is us. So to begin this turnaround... We have to put Jesus Christ at the center instead of ourselves. Are you satisfied with life? Are you, are you satisfied with a situation? If Christ is our sufficiency, then we will be satisfied because he is sufficient. It, if it takes material and physical blessings to make us thankful, then we're likely to be disappointed, depressed, or defeated when the physical or material blessings aren't there. When things don't turn out the way we think they should. <sighs> There's a wedding coming up in two weeks. And I'll just say this to everyone. I think I've already said it to the couple. It won't turn out the way you planned it. 
And you all know that from every wedding you've been to, there's always some little thing that wasn't what we had planned. And, and uh, I always go back to my daughter's wedding. She was just so into the wedding, the plans, the moment, the experience, outdoor pictures, everybody all dressed up all beautiful. And that morning it's pouring rain. <laughs> So they went to the store, they bought a bunch of matching black umbrellas and they took pictures outside. It was awesome. Circumstances change. Are we deflated, discouraged, depressed, or are we thankful? The secret lies in being satisfied with Jesus. No matter what happens, no matter what doesn't happen, no matter how things didn't measure up, I'm satisfied with just the fact that I got Jesus. Jesus is enough. Hebrews 13, 5, it says, let your covetousness be, or your conversation, your lifestyle be without covetousness. That means I want, I want, I want this, I want that. And be content with such thing as you have, for he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. So we're supposed to be content with things that we have. And by the way, God throws this on the end for us. Here's what we have. Jesus. He's with us. He never leaves us. He never forsakes us. We should be content with just that. Whether we're at home, whether we're on the job, at the store, anywhere, thankfulness should be that, that character trait that marks us as belonging to the Lord Jesus Christ. Someone that just popped into my mind as I think about a thankful person, someone who never complained. Do you remember Alfreda? I never heard that woman complain one single time. I never heard her say one ill word about any of you all. <laughs> That just wasn't part of her godly character. Here's a second trait. Every Christian should be committed. Romans 1 verse 9. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers. Now there's two traits in that verse. Let's just take the first half. Every Christian should be committed. Paul now is speaking to these Romans whom, he, who's he, who, whom, whom or who? Whose? Who? He has never met. I had to get the right grammar there. Every word he spoke, every word he wrote, every post he made, if he had had Facebook at that time, Everywhere he went, he was an example of total surrender to God. You could not look at the words he spoke, the words he wrote, the posts he made, and question whether or not he was totally surrendered to God. When nothing else matters but what matters to God, God's work will get done. Look what God did with Paul because he was totally committed. This is an area where I can always find work to do in my own life. Is your life committed? It should be. Romans chapter 12, verse 1, it says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Here's a third trait. Every Christian should be prayerful. This was the second part of verse 9. Paul's ministry was that of preaching the gospel. His secondary ministry was that of prayer. It was a priority. Let me just say this, okay? My ministry is primarily a pastor, okay? Not everyone in here is a pastor. There's lots of ministries here, okay? Your ministry may be that of a school teacher. Your ministry may be that of a utility worker, a power plant worker. Your ministry may be that of, um, I'm looking around trying to, a funeral director, 
I'm just looking at people's faces. We all have our, our primary ministry, whether we call it a job or not. It's our primary ministry. All of us can have this secondary ministry of prayer. In Ephesians, Paul prayed that believers would be spiritually strengthened. Here's how we can pray for each other. Spiritually strengthened, that they would be grounded in love. In Philippians, he prayed the believers would be sincere and without offense, that they would be filled with fruits of righteousness. In Colossians, he prayed for the believers there that they would be filled with spiritual knowledge, wisdom, understanding, that they would be strengthened with joy, long-suffering, and patience. These are things that he prayed for believers. Did he pray about any suffering they may be going through? Oh, I'm sure he did. But as we look at the whole of what he prayed for other believers, maybe our prayers for each other could model this. I mean, if, if we, if we, let's try to think about it this way. Should we pray for each other's needs? Yes, absolutely. Physical needs? Yes. But if we, all of us, in earnest prayer, with no sin in our life, come before God at one time, have this massive three-week-long prayer meeting where we're praying for all of our physical needs to be erased. Could God do that? Yes, he could. But as soon as those needs are erased, more are going to come in. Because that's life, okay? We're going to have physical needs in life. But as I see Paul's emphasis on prayer for other believers... I'm sure he prayed for their physical needs and suffering. Yes, he mentioned that. But across the board, most of his prayers were for their spiritual growth and development, their relationship with God. Where should most of our prayers be for each other? He's praying, his praying for them wasn't selfish, but rather it was always spiritual and it was always on behalf of others instead of himself. Now this begs the question <laughs> that you all have to answer for yourself. How much of our praying is selfish in nature? Lord, help me. Lord, bless me and my family. Lord, meet my need, meet this need. Christ was engaged in a ministry of intercessory prayer. That means praying on the behalf of others, for others. Romans chapter 15 and verse 1. We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. There it is again. It's not about us. I am to bear the infirmities of others and you are. And it's not about me. What does that mean in practical terms? It's not about whether I have the time to or not. It's not about whether I like the person or not. It's not about what I might get back in return. God said to bear the infirmities of others. Could this be an area where we can all improve? Let me ask this question. How would you describe your prayer life? Okay, who is the main topic of your prayer life? You or others? Another trait, number four, every Christian should be surrendered. Now we'll look at verse 10 together. Making request, if by any means now at length, I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come to you. Every Christian should be surrendered. This is the trait that Paul is demonstrating. Notice that Paul prayed that he might be used by God in answering that prayer. His desire was to travel to Rome. But Paul was willing to surrender his will to the will of God and not what he wanted. Paul was willing to 
lay aside his plans so that he might do the will of God. You know, here's the thing about the will of God. Sometimes it just gets in the way of our plans, doesn't it? <laughs> and then we have to make that decision. Okay, do I do what God says I should do or do I do what I want to do or what I'm comfortable doing? This is God's will for every believer. Willing to place his will ahead of our own. That's a surrendered heart. A surrendered heart is a heart that God can use for his glory. A heart that has no higher goal than just pleasing God. That was Christ's heart. Do you remember when he said this in John 4, 34? Jesus saith unto them, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. That was God's will for Christ. If that was God's will for me, uh, you know, God, I'm not really comfortable with this whole cross thing. I really don't like it when I walk down the street and people are jeering at me and mocking me. I'd rather not do that. I'm not comfortable with that. I've got some other things I'd rather do. Jesus was surrendered. And his heart was just to do God's will. And that was it. Just imagine what God could do with a church filled with people who were totally sold out to his will ahead of everything else in our lives. Here's another character trait. Every Christian should be usable. Now we go on to verse 11. For I long to see you that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift to the end you may be established. Paul's desire was to be used, okay? Paul tells him he wants to come to Rome. To give to them. Not so they can recognize him for all the churches he's planted. He wants to give to them. It's as if he is saying, listen, God has blessed me with some special things. I want to come to Rome and share them with you so that you might grow in the things of the Lord. Now, here's what he's not talking about. Special gifts or spiritual gift, it says there in verse 11. He's not talking about spiritual gifts. Because the Holy Spirit gives those, not the Apostle Paul. So what is he talking about here? Paul wanted to be usable with whatever God had gifted him with. He wanted to use those things for others. For example, do you all have time? Yes. I don't have much. Oh, you have as much as I do. Unless you're living in a twilight zone where your day is only 20 hours and mine's 24. <laughs> we all have the same amount of time. So, do you have time? Use it for others. Paul had some gifts that God gave him. And he wanted to use them for others. Do you have health? Use it for others. Can I, just, can I just turn to what may sound like begging? Use it for others while you have it. I've talked with too many people that have lost their health and they're still living. Where they once served and served and served and now they can't. Do you have health? Use it for others. Do you have strength? Use it for others. There is, a, there is a great need today for people in the church and in the community who are not primarily interested in their own agenda, their own to-do list. Whose main goal it is to just be usable to the Lord. 
It doesn't matter what they want. It doesn't matter what they are comfortable with or what they're not comfortable doing. There's a need, put me in, I'll do it. It doesn't matter what their preference is or what they want to do or don't want to do. If there's a need, plug me in, I'll do it. All they want is to be a blessing to those around them according to God's plan and not necessarily, it may not line up with their own. Can you honestly say that your life is a vessel that God can use and you've just totally surrendered it to him and you want to be usable? Number six, every Christian should be humble. Romans chapter one, verse 12, it says, that is that I may be comforted together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. Okay, the trait of humbleness here. Paul recognizes that they will be a blessing to him as well. Now, this is gonna take some humility for us to wrap our minds around this, I think. This is the great apostle Paul, the, the church planter on steroids, okay? Uh, he had started churches all over the known world. But he realized it isn't about him. They have things to share with him as well. They, things that he could learn from them. He had never got to the point as, as people do sometimes where they are above everyone else and they can't be told. Everyone, think about it this way. Everyone we talk to knows something that we don't. Everyone. So that means we can learn from everyone. Humility says no one is beneath us. It really is sad when, when people get to the place they think they've arrived. They have, maybe it's education. They have so much experience. You can't tell them anything because they know how to do it the right way. And there is no other way but their way. <laughs> uh, maybe they've been saved for a really, really, really long time and they couldn't possibly benefit from anyone else. I mean, you've heard the story of Jonah 42,000 times. You could tell the story of Jonah. There's nothing more for me to benefit from that, some people think. You really see that um, come up when a preacher comes into a church. How young is he? Ooh, that's too young. What could that young guy teach us? I'm not saying you've ever thought that, but that has been thought before. <laughs> Folks, if he's preaching to us from the Bible, there's stuff to be learned. That is just arrogance when we can't be told by someone whom we think is beneath us and we all still have growing to do would you agree with me on that yes don't say you've arrived okay i'll go back and redo this point <laughs> we haven't arrived yet Paul And Paul expressed this to the Philippians. In Philippians 3, verse 12, he said, Not as though I, the great apostle Paul, who's planted churches all over the world and wrote the book on church planting and missionary work, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after that if I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended. I don't consider myself to have arrived. But this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Paul, 
forgetting the churches he planted, forgetting how many times he read through his Bible in a year, forgetting how many times he's taught the Old Testament stories to churches, to, to children or teenagers, forgetting all of that stuff, forgetting how long he's been saved. It's as if this is day one of my Christian life. Do you remember what you did on the first day you got saved? The next day, the next day, the next day? Man, you were excited. You were reading God's word like it was going to disappear the next day. You were just soaking it all in, excited about being in church, excited about learning Christian songs, excited about being around church people. Yeah, but see, now, I mean, I know most of, more than most of these people in here. Not Paul. Forget it all. It's as if this is day one, ground zero, let's go. Time to grow and go. <laughs> that was his attitude. That should be ours. Number seven, every Christian should be fruitful. We go to verse 13 of Romans 1. Now, I would not have you ignorant, brethren, that oftentimes I purposed to come unto you, but was led hitherto that I might have some fruit among you also, even as among other Gentiles. He wanted to have some fruit among the church at Rome. Now, let's talk about uh, three types of fruit that are mentioned in the Bible. There's the fruit of attitudes, and we find those in Galatians 5, the fruit of the Spirit, okay, is what attitudes would be. Those should be present in everyone's life. If you have the Holy Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit should be there. By the way, we oftentimes take that passage in Galatians 5, 22 and 23, and we look at all of those attitudes, and we split them up individually. We call them fruits of the Spirit, there are no fruits of the Spirit. It's fruit. Here's why that's important. When we split them up, we'll work on one or two. The other ones that aren't present in our life, we'll say, well, I'm working on this one right now. <laughs> oh, no. Fruit of the Spirit displayed in these attitudes here. Here's a second type of fruit mentioned in the Bible, and that's the fruit of activity. Now, there's different types of activities that we could call fruit, okay? There is the fruit of holy living, Romans 6, 22. It says, but now, being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. So is there the action, the fruit of holy living? Here's another activity, praise, Hebrews 13, 15. By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. That fruit needs to be present in, ah, you just have never heard me sing, okay? I'm not talking about just singing. We're just talking about praising Jesus, but I don't like this, and I don't like that, and they should have done this differently. That is not praise in any shape or form, is it? Praise, praising Jesus. A third activity would be giving. The Bible talks about that as a fruit in Philippians 4, 16. For even in Thessalonica ye sent once and again unto my necessity, not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. Those are two types of fruit. Attitudes, activity. Here's the third type of fruit, addition. And that is simply this, the addition of souls. That's people coming to Christ. Your fruit, does it display that? Wherever our fruit is at the moment, we need to know our fruit glorifies God. That's why we should be concerned about our fruit. Here's number eight. Every Christian, and there's only 20, so we're getting good progress here. Just kidding. Number eight, every Christian should be 
obligated. Now, in verse 14, here's what Paul writes. He says, I am debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. And I want to focus on that use of the word debt. He says, I am debtor. It speaks, well, we all understand debt, don't we? Do you all owe anybody something? Okay, don't raise your hand. Okay, oh wait, I should. I would like to invite you all to our next Dave Ramsey financial peace class. Okay. Debt, we understand that. When we have a debt, we have an obligation to somebody, don't we? That's the word that Paul is using here. He is speaking of an obligation that he felt to those that didn't know Christ. The Greeks and to the barbarians. He felt obligated, like he, like he owed them money, like he owed them a debt. 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 24. <coughs> of the Jews, five times received I 40 stripes, save one. Three times was I beaten with rods. Once was I stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I have been in the deep. In journeyings often, in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils by my own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness, Beside those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. Wouldn't it have been easier if he just would have pulled back and just went to church on Sunday morning and said, there, God, I did my part. He felt obligated to the unsaved. Why did Paul do these things? These things that I just read, all of these things that he put himself in the position to experience. Why? Because he felt that he was a debtor to every lost person in the world. It's kind of like when we have a financial debt, and if we don't pay that debt, they're going to take our house, and you will be on the street. What do you do? You don't go in the basement and start playing video games, right? Right? You get another job. Now, I know that the, the older generations in this room here would just kind of laugh at that. But some people do that today. They go, oh, the government will bail me out. They don't have a concept of obligation. But those of us that do, we understand we're going to get another job, a second part-time job. Because we have an obligation. And a man's word is his honor. And if he said he's going to pay something, he needs to pay it. His name rides on that. It's a matter of integrity and character. That means we're going to do whatever we have to do to fulfill that obligation. It doesn't matter if I'm tired because I just worked 40 hours. I get another job because I have this obligation. And it means I... means. It means I won't be able to go hunting this Thursday. Man. You know what? If I was going to lose my house, who cares about hunting? I have an obligation to not just pay that bill, but I have an obligation to provide for my wife, to put a roof over her head. I have an obligation. It doesn't matter how tired I am. When I, when I was in, in college, oh, man, those were the days. <laughs> Had way too many work hours. And then, okay, because I was paying my way through. So then what did I decide to do in my junior year? I'm working full-time, going to school full-time, Plus a part-time job as well on the side to supplement what my full-time security guard job wasn't providing for my school bill. And then somewhere in the middle of my junior year, I decide, oh, I know. 
I'm going to get married this summer. Yes. So then I can come back and finish my senior year with another mouth to feed and the bill for an apartment and utilities and all of that. That was crazy. Okay. That was crazy. And we, we saw each other once a week. Okay. Uh, Tuesday afternoon was our date. She was teaching and I would pick her up after my classes and we went to, um, can't remember the name of that, that little place in Watertown, just down from the college. And on Tuesday, they had 25 cent tacos. <laughs> yes. And we had like one hour together and then she had to go to something at school and I had to go to work. And I got back after she had gone to bed that night. Uh, it was that way every day, 25 cent tacos. We could afford that. I would have loved to have spent more time with her. I would have loved to have really began nurturing our marriage that first year. But I had obligations that had to be met. And so I had to set aside what I wanted, the sleep I wanted, the comfort I wanted, the things that I wanted to do in order to meet my obligations. And this is the way Paul looked at the gospel. He felt himself obligated to everyone in the world. He felt a great need to share the gospel with everyone. Now, you and I are indebted as well. We are in debt to God for the gift of salvation that we were given. It was, it was a perfectly free gift, okay? We are, however, indebted to those who are dying around us because we, we, we hold in our hands the cure to the problem of sin for them. We, we hold in our hands the remedy for the disease that is killing them and that's going to keep them from going to heaven and spending eternity there. Every believer in this room needs to remember that we owe a debt to every person who lives around us. Yeah, but I'm tired. I don't feel like it. I'm not comfortable. The only way to discharge that debt is to talk about Jesus. Whether or not they accept Jesus or accept the truth or not doesn't matter. We have discharged our debt when we talk about Jesus, debt paid. Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, I like this verse. It says, but ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost part of the earth. That means it's not my personality. God said you will be given power. I'm tired. God says you will be given power. My mind doesn't think really fast. You will be given power. We have no excuses, is what that verse tells me, me personally. Here's our last trait. Number nine, every Christian should be eager. Now, in Romans chapter 1 and verse 15, here's what Paul writes. So, as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. Now, the word ready, it means eager. I can't wait till I get to Rome. I just can't wait to get there. I can't, I can't wait. Here's, here's a thought. I can't wait for another opportunity for outreach. For Saturday in December. I can't wait. Paul, Paul is excited about, about his, his call and his commission. He is an excited Christian. Are those a rare thing today? Excited Christian. We should be eager about serving God. Isn't it true that, that we often lack the excitement 
when it comes to God's work? I mean, just think about that. We really get into the things that we like. Hunting. Now, if Pastor Taylor scheduled outreach for Saturday morning at 4.30 in the morning, I would really struggle with that. I might even usurp him on that and uh, suggest that we change the time because I'm not going to be real excited about getting up at 4.30 to go do outreach. But Thursday morning this week, I will have no problem getting up at 4.30 to get all my hunting clothes on so I can go sit in a tree stand and freeze till the sun comes up. In fact, I'm actually excited about that. <laughs> we really get into things that we like. Hunting, fishing, football, cooking, shopping, or anything else that you can name. But when it comes to, when it comes to witnessing, where are we? Where are the Christians who are lining up for that? Where are those who, who get excited when it comes close to church time? When, when my kids were little and we were going on vacation, we couldn't tell my son until the morning of. If we told him anytime sooner, he would be up all night the night before. He wouldn't be able to sleep. He was just so excited. We're going on vacation. And then we'd go on vacation and he would be sick. <laughs> my grandson's the same way. They don't tell him until they're getting in the car that they're coming to Nana and Papa's house. Otherwise, he is just bouncing off the walls if he's awake or he's not sleeping if it's time for bed. Imagine being that way about church. Whew. It's almost time for church. It's almost time for church. You know, I don't have to be in my tree stand till a certain time, technically, okay? But I'll get in there like 15, 20 minutes before I need to be in there. I don't know why. I guess I'm a little sadistic. I like to torture myself with the cold. I don't know. But I'm just so excited. I can't wait to get there. Imagine if, if Christians were like that and when it came time to go to church. I can't wait to get there. I can't wait to get there. What? Oh, man, we're going to be 15 minutes early. So what? I can't wait to be there. <laughs> God needs believers who are excited about the things of God. Folks, we need a reality check, perhaps. Uh, a dose of, of reality of what we are involved in. What our real business is here on this earth. In the time that God has us here. He put us here, he saved us, and he's taken us out at a certain time for our real business to be here. Would you, would you describe your life as one that is eager about doing God's will? If not, there should be some changes that we have to make. Folks, we are running out of time. And we need that sense of urgency about our service to God. One day, our lives will end, and it'll be too late to work for the Lord. It'll be too late to bear fruit. John chapter 9 and verse 4, it says, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh. When no man can work. Paul perhaps represents what every Christian should be. Have we, have we taken the time to examine our own life this morning? Uh, are there areas where you need to move closer to God's will to line up with that? Are there areas maybe that need to be surrendered? 
is there that lack of eagerness and urgency that needs to be confessed and dealt with? If there is a spiritual need, I invite you to just bring it before God this morning. He'll meet you there and then take you where you need to be.